Okay, so we spent last time talking about um, histogram and point operations, right? That would be, you know, in a very general way, talking about changing the colors of an image, right? Uh, the, the positions of the pixels in the image doesn't change, but we're just changing how the image looks, right? Today we want to focus on geometric operations, which are actually going to change the size and the shape of an image. Okay, and so this situation is, um, we're gonna stay in the world of Euclidean coordinates today. Remember I told you that there was like the image coordinate world and the Euclidean coordinate world. So today we stay in uh, Euclidean coordinates. Meaning we have an axis like this, just like what you're used to. X increases in this direction and Y increases in that direction. And so, mostly what we're going to talk about today are situations where we have a transformation that looks like this. Um, we have a new image, J, and we have an old image, I, and then we have a transformation, T. Okay. And so, this is the basic idea. So this is, again, a geometric operation. Why is that? Well, this basically is saying, you know, where does pixel x, y of this new image come from? It comes from some transformed version of x, y in the original image, right? So this is like saying, this pixel of j will take its color from some pixel of i. The color doesn't change, but the location in image i where that pixel comes from is different than x, y, okay? So just to contra contrast that with what we talked about last time, we talked about last time was saying more like this, saying j of x, y was the transformation of the color at x, y. So, so this is like saying, take the color at x, y and turn it into some other color and keep it in the same place. This is the other way around, saying keep the same color but get that color from a different place, right? So these are the two kind of you know, dual operations of each other, okay? So basically this is saying, you know, this is like the, um, coordinates of the new image. And these are like coordinates of the old image. And so let's make this concrete with a bunch of examples, okay? So just as a preview, this is actually very similar to the first lecture that we do in a class like Signals of Systems or DSP, where we talk about this notion of scaling a signal, shifting a signal, and flipping a signal, right? We can do all the same things with images, and I think in images, it's a little bit more intuitive, right? So for example, we may have, say something like this. J of x, y is equal to i of x plus two comma y. So what is this process going to do to the image? Well, let's think about it. If I have my old image, i of x, y, and today I'm going to usually assume for the most part that 0, 0 is in the middle of the image, okay? And I want to draw what happens to my new image, so let me, let me make a, you know, make an image here. So what's this saying? This is saying that for example, j at location 0, 0 is equal to i at location 2, 0, right? So if I want to know where does 0, 0 come from over here, it comes from this pixel, right? And where does j of, for example, minus 2, 0 come from? It comes from 0, 0 here. So what that means is that the image is going to be translated to the left by two pixels. And this is actually, you know, kind of the similar, you know, this is exactly what we're talking about when we have a signal, right? If I have, um, you, you can imagine if I only had a one-dimensional image, right? So let's talk about signal assistance for a second. If I have, like, y of t is equal to x of t plus 2, right? That's like saying that if I have my old signal that does this, 
my new signal is going to shift left like this. So it's like a negative delay by two units, right? And so the only thing to kind of keep in mind is which way am I shifting, left or right? And it's always, if you're not quite sure, it's always easiest just to plug in some values of the new image and see where the pixels come from in the old image. That's the easiest way to tell whether you're doing the shifting right. Kind of in the same way, we could say something like, you know, j of x, y is equal to i of x comma y minus 10, right? So this is my old image. And this is my new image. Again, I can plug in and say, this is going to shift things in the y direction in some sense, right? And if we think about which way it should shift, we can say, okay, that means that j of 0, 0 is going to be i of 0 minus 10. So that means that this point is inheriting its value from this point here, which means that things will be shifted down, right? So what used to be here will go like this, right? Um, I think that's what we're saying. Let me do another one just to make sure. J of 0, 10 is equal to I of 0, 0. So that means that this point here, oh, I guess I screwed this up, is going to go to this point here. All right, sorry. See, even I can get confused sometimes, right? So again, you have to think about which way things should shift by plugging in numbers and making sure that you have the right answer. Uh, let me just pause and think about this for a second to make sure that I didn't screw this up. So this is where the confusion between x and y comes from. This is x, this is y. So this is basically saying, I think that I did this okay, right? It's early in the morning. I'm still kind of waking up. All right, I feel good about this. Okay, so basically this is the notion of translating the image, okay? And so um, all that means is I'm taking the image and I'm picking it up and moving it over, right? And of course I can have translation in both directions if I want, okay? So just in the same way as translation, we can also do image scaling, right? So suppose that I want to take an image, I want to, you know, take my megapixel image that I got from my vacation, or probably hopefully a 10 megapixel image, and I want to scale onto my web page to make it a, you know, 720 pixel wide image, right? So scaling is like saying my new image is, for example, my old image with a factor of two. So what is this going to mean? Well, again, this is my original image, and this is my new image. Let's think about what happens. So that's like saying that j at 0, 0 is equal to i at 0, 0. That doesn't really tell us anything other than things seem to be centered still. It says that j uh, 1, 1 is what used to be i at 2, 2, right? So that means that this pixel is getting its intensity from this over here. So that means that the image is going to shrink down, right? So I'm going to get a smaller image, right? Because by the time I get to halfway here, I'm already at the edge of this image here, right? So again, this may be a little bit counterintuitive in the sense that you see the two multiplying things and you think, oh, this is magnifying things by two, right? But just like in the signal assistance world, if I had the two inside the parentheses, that meant things would get shorter, right? So this is like playing the signal twice as fast, meaning it lasts twice as, or it, it is uh, half as short, right? And the same way, if I had a, uh, a different factor, for example, if I had this guy, like i of uh, one third x, one third y, that would be like saying that if this is my original image, that what used to be, uh, say, what the new image at three three is equal to the old image at one one, right? So that means that things are going to be magnified, right? This pixel takes its value from this pixel over here, which means I'm going to have an image that is three times as big. And of course, I can combine these two things in different directions, right? So for example, I could say um, an image like uh, 
2x one half y is going to be smaller in the x direction and bigger in the y direction. So I have an image that starts out like this, and it turns into, well, it's going to be skinnier in the x direction, but taller in the y direction. So something that looks like this, right? So I can do kind of non-uniform changes in shape. Okay. Now again, in uh, you know Photoshop or something like that, these operations are all really automated for you, right? You just tell the you know you tell the program how much you want to change the image, and it tells you what you know, it gives you back the image without you having to do any real calculations. But this is kind of what's going on under the hood. Similarly, one of the things you sometimes want to do is mirror image or flip the image across one of its axes, right? So say that you know in one case you've got you know, an interviewee talking to somebody on their right, you want to flip it around so it looks like they're talking on the left. And so that flipping of a signal is simply putting a negative sign inside the parentheses. So that's like saying, for example, if I flip the x values and keep the y values the same, so if this is my original image, that's like saying that remember this is the x direction and this is the y direction. So that's like saying that the x direction is the same, but what I called y is going to flip, right? So this is going to reflect, right, did I get this wrong? I said minus x, right? So that means that what used to be positive x changes to negative x. So that means I'm gonna have something like this. This is gonna reflect the image across the y axis. And the same way, if I'm going to flip across, if I'm going to change the sign on y, that means things are going to flip this way. So if I'm going to do j of xy equals i of x minus y, that means that I'm going to get the x's are going to stay the same and my y's are going to flip. So it's going to look like a r, if I can draw it like this. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I pause and ask, any comments or questions about any of that? Yes? Are you scaling? So you shrink from UV also losing information? Yes, that's a good point. So when I do this shrinking, I'm losing some information in the image, right? And, and in the same way, when I expand, I have to hallucinate some new information that wasn't in the original image. So we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, right? So there's an interesting question of how do I actually figure out what these pixel colors should be in this new image, right? So yes, we're definitely going to talk about that. Other comments or questions? OK. So we can take all these ideas, the scale and the shift and the flip, and put them into one nice package. So it's very common for um, you know, scale plus shift plus flip to be combined into um, what's called a 2D linear transformation. So I'm going to write this like this. So here, this is like the coordinates of the original image, i of x, y. And this is like the coordinates of the transformed image, j of x, y. And then I have six numbers that specify this transformation. Okay. And so this is basically going to be something like this. So this is a recipe that says where does zero or where does xy in the old image 
go to, also known as the forward mapping. So in this form, this is actually a little bit different than what I just wrote, right? Because in some sense, what I just wrote for the guys earlier, right? This is something like, you know, when I write this formula, this is like saying, where did pixel x, y in the new image come from? This is like the backwards mapping. This is like going the other way. This is saying, okay, where do, do old pixels get pushed to in the new image? And in this form, things are a little bit more intuitive, I think. So for example, we could say something like this. So translation is easily represented as the new image coordinate is equal to, you know, don't change anything, identity matrix times the old image coordinate plus, you know, some translation. Or a scale says x prime, y prime is some factor times x and some factor times y. Or a flip would be a matrix like this, for example. This would say flip the x value and keep the y value the same. And you can imagine this is basically a special case of scaling where one of the alphas or the betas could be negative. Okay. So usually we actually write these transformations more compactly by specifying this matrix and this vector. Okay. Now in this form, we can see that there are some things that we can do to images that we couldn't really do to one-dimensional signals, right? So one example, a very common example, is rotation. Okay. So oftentimes, like I was talking about before, you, know, you take an image and it looks a little bit off and we have to rotate it back to make it look right. You know, for example, we want to take the horizon line and make it horizontal. So how does rotation look in this form? Okay. So you know, we can do things to images, horrible things that we can't do to 1D signals, or at least doesn't make sense to do such things to 1D signals. And one very common thing to do is rotation. So for example, what I want to do is I want to take my original image, and I want to, for example, rotate it by some number of degrees. So if this is my original coordinate axes, and this is kind of where those coordinate axes go, and this is my new x-axis, kind of what I want to say is I want to know how to rotate this image by theta degrees. In this case, I'm rotating it counterclockwise. So this is like a rotation by theta degrees counterclockwise. Bless you. And so let's think about what is the corresponding matrix in this form that accomplishes that operation. Well, the easiest thing to do is to, to fill in these blanks. We can actually think about, OK, so I can plug in some, actually, to make this a little bit easier. First of all, let's observe, even though I drew this drawing in a kind of a crappy way, that let's suppose that I want to rotate this around the origin, OK? Around the origin. So I don't basically want there to be any translation. I just want to go straight pinwheel around the middle. OK. So this function is going to turn out to look something like this. So we have to find these numbers to figure out what the translation or what the rotation does. And the easiest way to see what happens is, let's suppose I plug in 1, 0 here. So if I plug in 1, 0, then the output 
coordinate is going to be a, b, c, d times 1, 0, which is just going to be the first column, a, c. And the same way, if I put in 0, 1, then my output is going to be the second column, b, d. So all I need to do is kind of think about where do those two important points go to, and that helps me fill in the entries of this matrix. Okay? So let's take a look at my picture, right? I'm going to kind of redraw it. So let me redraw my picture. Here is my original image. And it's going to go to this new image. I'm going to kind of draw this a little bit better. So here are the new axes. Okay, so let's suppose that this value here is 1, 0. And I want to know where did that point go? Well, it went over here. Okay. And what are the new x, y coordinates of that pixel? Well, this is a trigonometry problem, right? So I can say, okay, this distance here was 1 in the original image. So this hypotenuse here has to be 1. And I need to know what are the coordinates of this point. Well, this is just, if this angle is theta, I can use my trigonometry to know that this is the cosine of theta, and this is the sine of theta, right? That's just by definition. And so that means that what used to be 1, 0 moves over to cosine theta, sine theta. And where does 0, 1 go? Well, 0, 1 goes over here. Again, this is the same triangle that I have over here. The height of the triangle is cosine theta. And this distance here is sine theta, but it's going the other direction. So this here is negative sine theta. So that point goes to uh, x value of minus sine theta, y value of cosine theta. And so the whole rotation, putting it together, is that the new coordinate is the special matrix, cosine theta, minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta, times the original coordinate. Okay, so this is the formula for a rotation matrix. Okay, so any questions or comments about how I got there? Have people seen this matrix before? I've seen the inverse a lot. Yeah, so the inverse is basically going to be the transpose of this, right? So if I want to rotate going the other way, then I would just change the signs on theta. The cosines would just stay the same, and the signs would flip. So it's important to remember what the right sign on um, you know, the signs should be. And again, you can always recover yourself by drawing a picture like this to know which way it should go, right? OK. So now we've got the, the main transformations, shifting, scaling, flipping, and rotating. Okay? And so any combination of these is called a similarity transformation. So any combination of scale, shift, rotate is called a, well, actually, I should, I should say, um, yeah, call a similarity transformation. So it does things like it preserves, you know, parallel lines. Um, I feel like I've, uh, yeah, stuff like that. I mean, if this alpha and beta in this scaling function are equal to plus or minus 1, then it's called an isometric transformation, which is better. Because that means that 
uh, also sometimes called a rigid motion. That basically means that it preserves, um, you know, shapes and angles between lines and things like that. So just so you know, we're going to do a whole bunch of actual image processing examples on MATLAB in, in towards the end of the class. I just kind of get you the theory first, then we're going to do a whole bunch of examples. So this will be made more concrete in about 10 minutes. Okay. So another thing that we can do to images that isn't like one of these kind of more shape-preserving transformations, because right now all we're really doing is we're, we're changing the rotation and the scaling of an image, but fundamentally the image looks more or less the same, right? Except maybe I'm stretching it in one or two dimensions, right? But um, sometimes we want to bend the image, kind of um, so if you think about it, when I have a um, when I have a transformation like this, I guess I should actually just fill in A, B, C, D like this. Actually, let me just write that better because I don't like the way it is. So there are some degrees of freedom in this representation that we still haven't used up yet. So for example, um, what if we had a transformation like this. So we take A equals 1, B is some number, C is equal to 0, D is equal to 1. So this is not really one of the transformations we've talked about so far, right? It's not a rotation, it's not an exact scaling, it's not a translation. So what's happening here? This is like saying that the new x coordinate is the old one plus some multiple of y, and the y coordinate stays the same. Okay. So what does that do to our image? Let's think about that. So this is saying y is unchanged, and x is changing, and it's changing differently depending on the y value in the image. So let's just draw a picture. Again, let's think about this image here. So let me put some you know, numbers on this image. So again, if this is the x direction and then this is the y direction, and this is 0, 1, and this is 0, minus 1. Okay. So what does this transformation, which by the way is called a shear, do to the image? Okay, so let me rewrite what that is. That's saying x prime y prime is equal to x plus b y y. Okay, well first of all the y values are not going to change. That means that the height of the output is going to be the same as the height of the input, but the x values are going to change. And so let's think about what happens to uh, minus, well first of all let's look at what happens to 0, 0. So 0, 0 is just going to stay where it is. What happens to 1 comma 0? Well, since y is equal to 0, that's also going to stay where it is. In fact, everything on the you know, x-axis is going to stay where it is. So that means that I'm going to have you know, these points are all going to stay where they are. What happens to, for example, uh, 0 comma 1? So 0 comma 1 is going to go to b comma 1. Okay? And 1 comma 1 is going to go to 1 plus b comma 1. And minus 1 comma 1 is going to go to minus 1 plus b comma 1. So that's basically saying that all these points are going to get shifted over by some value b. 
right? So, for example, let's suppose that B was positive. That's going to mean that this point here goes to minus 1 plus B, comma 1. This point here is going to go to 1 plus B, comma 1. What happens to the points down here? Well, negative 1, comma 1 is going to go to negative 1 minus B, comma, minus 1, sorry. Uh, 0, comma, minus 1 is going to go to minus B, comma, minus 1. 1, comma, minus 1 is going to go to 1 minus B, comma, 1. So again, the Y value is staying the same, but these old these X values are now moving to the left. So that means that these guys are going to kind of move over here to minus 1 minus B. This guy's going to move to 1 minus B, and so on. So kind of the resulting image that I'm going to get is going to be what's called a shear. It's like I'm pushing the image over. And so the bigger B is, the more squeezed or more sheared that image is going to be. Okay. Or I, if I were to choose a different, uh, so if, if my B was negative, it would be pushed over to the left instead of pushed over to the right. And in the same way, I could have a matrix like this. where I put the off-diagonal element over here. That's going to have a result of taking the old image and doing something like this to it. So this is called like a vertical shear. And if I kind of have both things, right? So if I have something like 1, B, C, 1, then I can take what used to be a square and kind of turn it into a parallelogram where the axes are not aligned with the you know, x, y axes. That looks like I've kind of pushed it over in one direction vertically and pushed it a little bit more in another direction, whoops, horizontally. Okay. So this lets me turn basically a rectangle into a parallelogram. Right, so that's definitely going to uh, change the image more substantially. And finally, the, the last thing I want to talk about is, so let me put it all together. So I guess I didn't say the, the magic words. So basically, a general transformation of the form What we've been talking about A, B, C, D, X, Y, plus E, F is called an affine transformation. Okay. And I want to say one more thing, and then I'm going to go do some MATLAB for a while to kind of make it more interesting for you guys. So we can do even more transformations, more general transformations than this, right? So most of the class, we're going to be basically dealing with not much more than these affine transformations. But there are some cases where you need to do what's called a perspective transformation or a projective transformation, where you have to distort the image even more, right? So for example, I can't, with an affine transformation, do anything more than turn a rectangle into a parallelogram. But if I want to turn the rectangle into some other weird generic quadrilateral, you know, something where um, where this could be like some general four-sided object, right? So rectangle to quadrilateral, which I kind of made a hash of drawing there. So this is basically called a projective transformation. 
And I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Okay, so let's actually, you know, take a look at, at how you do these things in MATLAB, okay? All right. So, um, let's... Take a look at this guy. Is it played out already? Well, it's too bad. We're going to talk about the left shark. Okay. So what we're going to do here is uh, their MATLAB has a bunch of um, image processing tools to deal with geometric operations. There's a whole category here, geometric transformations. And so I'm just going to fool around with some of these things. So we talked about uh, rotating the image. Okay. So um, first I'm going to turn these orange guys off. I know what I'm doing. Okay, so let's talk about this image rotate. So um, as you might expect, it takes the input image and then the angle, right? And the angle is in degrees. And so if I just say that my output image is going to be my rotated input image by 30 degrees counterclockwise, then this is what I get, right? As expected. So you can see that MATLAB has chosen to fill in the rest of the pixels with black because when I rotate the image, right, it's becoming bigger. It's instead of having, you know, the original height and width, it's getting taller and wider and I have to fill in those pixels with something, right? So it's filled in black. Um, so there was a question about uh, how do you know what to do? How do you know what pixels to fill in here? We're going to talk about that when we go back to the paper and pencil part. But we can see that there are well, actually, let me come back to this point after I do some more paper and pencil stuff, but we're going to come back to this. Okay, so that's image rotation. How do I deal with generic um, affine transformations? Well, there's a command called imwarp, okay? So this is a little bit, in my opinion, clumsy in MATLAB, but this is the way it is. So uh, if I want to make an affine transformation, there's a command called affine2d. So affine2d basically... Uh, let's see if I can make this bigger here. So basically what I'm doing is I'm specifying the A, B, C, D, E, F that I want to use. The A, B, C, D is the part that encapsulates the rotation and translation, or the rotation and uh, scaling, and the E, F is what encapsulates the translation. And so, for example, all I have to do is say, okay, T is affine 2D. And so let's start out by making an affine 2D matrix that's exactly the same as this rotation. Um, I don't need your help, but I can't get rid of you. Okay, so just a quick reminder, by the way, that when I do cosine of 30, for example, so what? So let's think about this. What should cosine of 30 be? We got some people saying a half. We got some people saying square root of 3 over 2. It's one of those. It's one of those. Because it'd be a bigger one, right? Root 3 over 2. So. Uh, Actually, it's easier to see what, what should sine 30 be. Let's think about that. So sine 30 should be, all right, wait a second. Right, should be root 3 over 2. So I guess those of you that don't know these things off the top of your, oops. Uh -huh. So root 3 over 2 is this one, right? You want to make sure that when you do cosines and sines in MATLAB, either you convert to degrees first, or you can just use this cosine d instead of um, instead of just cosine, right? So this is saying take the cosine in degrees. And so if I want to make a matrix like my affine transformation that just rotates, I could say uh, it's going to be a 3 over 3 matrix. I need the cosine. Let's go back to my uh, notes. So I need to have cosine minus sine. Then I have a 0. Then I have sine cosine. And then I have, OK, so here's my matrix. And then what I can do is I can take my output is going to be my warping of, well, I guess I didn't actually make the matrix yet. So I'm going to have, um, I 
Athline 2D of this. This basically just turns it into a kind of, this is kind of like an object-oriented programming thing where it has a, you know, a class. This is our Athline transformation that contains the matrix I just told it. And then I can apply my Athline transformation to an image by this imwarp command. And, oops, eh, come back. Oddly enough, I get the same thing that I had before, right? Okay, but now I can do different things, right? So now I can do the uh, examples I showed you earlier. So what if I was to do something like um, making an affine transformation that was like a shear, right? So I could say 1.10, 1 .1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So again, this, this T is this weird object. I can kind of see that my matrix is inside this. Right, so this is going to be a horizontal shear. And if I apply this to my image, well, it's kind of subtle, right? Um, basically, it looks like the shark is not that warped. So let's make this shark a little bit more warped. Right, so here I'm warping it more and more. Now, this brings to mind a question about why. Oh, okay, so yeah, this is again one of these Cartesian to image coordinate problems, right? So let's take a look at this again, or let's take a look at doc fn 2 d So this is exactly what I said. What I'm trying to get at is I'm trying to explain why the shear is going the wrong way. Because again, I was just telling you that this should keep the y values the same and change the x values. But in this image, it seems pretty clear that the x values are the same and the y values are getting changed. I think this is, again, a goofy MATLAB convention. Because if I do the shear the other way, right? if I put in something like this, then I get the shear that I kind of told you about earlier. And if I put in numbers in both places, then I should be able to get basically a parallelogram. Right, so here I'm taking the rectangle and turning it into a parallelogram. Okay. So, let me pause here and say that if I think about this uh, affine 2D, right, if I still have that help window up, so this thing is taking six numbers, right? A, B, C, D, E, F. And there are two zeros here. And the question is, what do these two zeros mean? And that's related to what's called the projective transformation. So if I go back to this for just a second. So how could I do this kind of transformation? A projective transformation is more general. So that's like saying, instead of having this matrix operation, I have something that looks a little bit more complicated. I have one part that looks still kind of uh, affine. And then I have a denominator that makes things more complicated. And kind of one way I think about this is to say that um, my matrix can be kind of collected into eight numbers like this. If I multiply these things together, I'm basically getting the numerator and the denominator and 
and my actual x prime is equal to taking the first element that I got and dividing it by the second element I got. Kind of related to, or kind of similar looking to the way that perspective projection works. But basically the idea is that I can take this thing and represent it like this three by three matrix, as, and that's exactly what MATLAB is asking for when you give it a projective transformation. And so it turns out that these numbers here are what control how kind of skew the image looks. So just like there's a command called affine 2D, there's also a command called projective 2D in MATLAB. And so if I want to um, make one of those, then what I do is something like this. I'd say that my transformation, oops, oh, that was weird. I could say something like my transformation is projective 2D. And here's an example of that. So let's make something that has got some pretty small values. So basically, the bottom part is telling me the translation. Okay, this is the saying, move the image around a little bit. This part is saying, you know, the, the upper 2D. Uh, two by two matrix is telling me, you know, don't really do any rotation or skew the image. But then this little number here, which doesn't seem like it's going to have a lot of effect, is going to significantly skew the image. And so if I apply the transformation to my image, you're going to see that now it's going from a rectangle to a quadrilateral, right? And if I were to increase this number, so you'll need to kind of keep this sharp guy over here. Yeah. So if I were to increase this number here to be a little bit more and apply it again, then I'm really warping that image, right? And if I put in you know numbers for both places. You know, then I can kind of get this arbitrary, you know, sized quadrilateral, right? So, why do you ever want to do this to an image, right? So, here's an example where I actually had to um, do this in, in real life, right? So, we were having our bathroom redone, and I had these um, these tiles. So, basically, this is like a um, So basically, this is like an eight foot tall array of tiles that I laid out on my floor, right? And I had the contractor coming, and I wanted to print out one big tall image for him to make sure he put the tiles in the right places, right? But I couldn't take a picture that got everything. Oh, I don't want the shark. The shark was not part of it. I wanted a picture like this, right? So how am I going to make that? Well, what I need to do is figure out what is the transformation that aligns every pair of images, right? And so how could we do that with the tools that we just learned about? Well, if you notice, for example, um, let's see what's a good example. So here's one image, and here's another image. You can see that the blue tile that's on the right here and on the left here are the same in both images, right? So if I know what the coordinates are for the same image location or the same you know image chunk in two different views, I should be able to associate those two things with a spatial transformation, right? And so MATLAB provides some tools to be able to do that. So let's see how that works. So there's a command called um, CP select that stands for control point select. So let's see. I forgot which one of these guys I wanted to do. So let's do 2A and 3A. So I think these are the blue tiles, right? Here's the one, and here's the other. Okay. So now what I can do is I can say CP select M1, M2. And this gives me a little interface that allows me to manually match corresponding points. Okay, And so this is like a real pain with the mouse, but luckily I have a little stylus with my laptop. So what I can do is I can move 
around this image and locate the same point in both images. And then I can start to just kind of manually connect the dots of places that I see in both images, right? Like this corner is the same. So, you know, this is like a nice little function of MATLAB to be able to let me um, move around the image and associate matching points, right? So all I'm doing is I'm clicking on corresponding points. If I got something wrong, like I click over here by mistake, I can just kind of grab this guy and move it back over here. Um, and so generally, you need to get as many corresponding points as you can. Um, oops, I think that this guy is bad because I can't find the matching point over here. It's off the image, so I should probably delete this guy if it's possible. Or I guess actually all I can do is move this guy. Just move it over. So I'm going to move this guy over here. Click on some more points. Again, if you're doing this for real, you want to be as careful as you can. I'm being a little bit sloppy. Uh, okay, so now I've got 12 corresponding points. And then there should be a command that says export points to workspace. So now I've got two new MATLAB variables, moving points and fixed points. And then I wrote a function um, to use those points to build a geometric transformation. And so if I do, um, I forget what I called this mosaic, I guess, oddly enough. So I have to say that I, you know, um, think that MATLAB is a little bit clumsy in this regard. It can be done. But basically, the idea is that what I'm doing is I'm supplying the points that just came out of CP select. And I'm saying fit an affine transformation using this command called fit geotrans. Okay? And then there are some commands to say, OK, now warp the second image into the same coordinates as the first image and put them together into a mosaic. And so if I do that, I take my original points and the stuff that came out of here. And I guess I should assign that to an output variable. So what I got is this image, right? So you can see that I was a little bit sloppy, right? I didn't actually pay a lot of attention to making sure that my control points lined up super precisely. If I was more careful, I could have done a better job. But you can see that the images line up pretty well, OK? One of the reasons they don't line up perfectly is it turns out that an affine transformation is not the right underlying model for how these two images are related together. It turns out they're related together by at least a projective transformation, and probably by even more complicated things. So for example, since I was kind of close to these images, maybe there was some lens distortion in my camera that I would need to model to make this geometric process match the best. And so again, I shouldn't have to do this in MATLAB, right? People have, have written you know, programs to do this for me. And so actually, uh, Dr. Stewart in our computer science department is the founder of a startup company that does exactly this. And so. If I can get my windows straight. Hey. So he has a company called Dual Align, and I'm continuing my trial. And so basically, this is a uh, piece of software that does a great job of mosaicing different images. And so if I select the images in my workspace here, I select these things. So luckily for me, I don't have to actually um, manually select any control points here. So Dr. Stewart's code is going to automatically find control points. I guess I have to actually select these guys. Uh, select all, OK. Trying to figure out how this works. I think I'm missing a button here. OK. I did the images. How come I can't do it? Generate. OK, so now it's doing some automatic processing. It's extracting these matching points that I was manually clicking on automatically. We'll talk about how this program might be doing that in some later lectures. That's a little closer to a computer vision problem. It doesn't actually know how these images are all related together, like which one comes first, which one comes second. It's automatically figuring that out. And then it produces for me exactly the image I showed you earlier. right? So if I uh, zoom in on that image, and I guess I already have it stored in my uh, directory here. So you know, here's that image. So if I were to zoom in on it, I can see 
that the seams in the image are pretty imperceptible. I mean, um, you know, I don't see any obvious artifacts. You can see that there is a little bit of lens distortion in the sense that, you know, the tiles at the bottom are smaller in the image than the tiles in the middle. So things are kind of bowed out, but you can fix that in, in post-production later on. So this is a pretty good automatic alignment. And probably your digital camera comes with some software that will do that for you. I don't know if it does it onboard the camera, but certainly you probably have something where you can read the images off your camera and then you can say these images form a you know, set of images I took on vacation when I was at some beautiful vista and I kind of took pictures like this with the hope of turning them into one big mosaic later on. And so um, Dr. Stewart's code is actually, I think, much more robust than the stuff that comes with your, with your digital camera. And so if you're interested in looking it up, the company is called Dual Align. And uh, if they have any examples here. I'm looking for pictures. Show me pictures. There we go. Right. So Here are some more complicated examples, right? So this is downtown Troy, you know, at different seasons, different times of day, with different shadows, and the algorithm is still able to figure out what parts of the image are the same, and then what geometric transformation is required to align them. And so you can see, for example, that when the large image flashes in, that that's definitely not just cutting and pasting a rectangular image, it's actually warping that image using some transformation similar to the projective transformation we talked about. Here again, taking multiple images, and the fact that these images are coming out to the image plane is curved means there's something more going on even besides a projective transformation. There's probably some sort of a lens distortion term that is changing straight edges to curved edges. And so if you want to learn more, you can go to dualaligned.com and even download the software. So the last thing I want to talk about today is what was brought up earlier is when I take an image and I change its shape, bending it, making it bigger in some directions, it, I clearly have to figure out new pixel colors that weren't in the original image. It's not like I can just sample colors from the original image. I have to do some hallucination of new colors, right? And so how does that process work? OK. So let's go back to this guy. So how to actually create the output image? Well, here's the problem, right? So suppose I have this affine transformation. So in real life, you know, the numbers that you have in these matrices are not uh, just integers. And so now I want to know, OK, so where does the point 1 comma 1 go? Well, I plug in my numbers. I get, um, you know, 1 comma 1 goes to 1.2 plus 1 plus 3.2 is 5.4. And then the y coordinate is 1.8 minus 1.6 is 0 0.2, right? So that's a problem, right? Because I have all integer coordinates in my image before, and now I'm transforming it into all these non integer coordinates, right? So a different way of thinking about that is that what used to happen, or what I used to have, was a nice grid where my pixel values fell on nice integer locations. And after transformation, let's suppose that these are the kind of integer xy locations in the new image. What may happen after my image is transformed is that these points go to a whole bunch of weird places over in the new image, right? And so how am I going to get the values at, for example, this location and this location and this location that I need, right? So how to get image colors or intensities on the new grid.
Well, um, you know, you could argue that one thing that you could do is just kind of like take, you know, if I want to know what, what value this guy should be at, I should just like find the nearest black dot and take its color, for example, would be a, a crude solution, right? So, you know, that could work kind of, but on the other hand, if the black dots are really far away from the circles, then I'm going to have a big error in what that image looks like, right? Um, a better thing to do is to go the other way. So it's um, more conventional to use backwards mapping instead of forwards mapping. What I mean by that is if I have this affine transformation, I should be able to invert it, right? So if this was my original forward mapping, pushing pixels from image one over to image two, and here you notice I've kind of changed things so that this here is a two by two matrix and this here is a two by one vector, right? So I should be able to undo this process, right? So if I were to move, uh, if I wanted to get x, y by itself, what I could do is I could move the b over and I could multiply that by a inverse, right? And this turns into some new affine transformation. So this is like the inverse transformation. So how does this help? Okay, so what I've done is I've changed this from a transformation where I have, you know, the points going forward to here. Instead, now what I have is representation of this, where I have the new grid. This is the new image. And I have a set of points on this grid. And now I know where should each of these points have come from on the old grid. That's kind of like applying the inverse transformation. So if this is the coordinate system of the old grid, now these black dots are going to come over here somewhere. So you're asking yourself, why is this any better? Well, what's better is that now if I want to know, for example, what should this black dot be, the idea is that I can kind of analyze what's going on inside the square where this black dot fell, right? If I kind of blow up the square, what I see is here is the point that I want to figure out the color of, and then here are a bunch of points where I know the color based on the original image, okay? And so, um, like I said, you know, another thing I could do, like I said in the beginning, would be every black dot just takes its color from the nearest pixel on the grid. If I were to do that, actually, things would not look so good. So let's take an, an example in MATLAB. Um, I have too many windows open here. Let's close this guy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, That's great. So if I were to say, okay, suppose I want to um, look at that M rotate command again, that has a couple of options for me, right? It has this method. What does method mean? Method means how do I fill in these pixels? And actually, it turns out that the default method is exactly this, nearest neighbor. And so if I were to look closely at my shark, so... Let's make a transformation. Well, let's just let's just take my uh, rotation of shark, and if we zoom in on the shark, you know, we can see that the uh, pixels are a little bit blocky, a little bit jaggedy, right? We could do better than that with a method that's on, which is what I'm showing you now, called bilinear interpolation. So this method here 
operates as follows. And I'm going to redraw this on a uh, better picture here. So let's suppose that I have blowing up this kind of one square between four known pixels. And I'm going to call those known pixels um, you know, A, B, C, and D. Okay, so if my dot lands right on A, then I should just take A, right? If the dot lands, you know, between A and B, well, it seems like what I should do is I should take a combination of A and B, right? If I'm right halfway in between, I should take half and half. If I'm closer to A, I should take more of A, and if I'm closer to B, I should take more of B, right? So let's suppose that since the distance between these integer image coordinates is one, let's suppose that this distance is alpha and this distance is one minus alpha, right? So it kind of makes sense that the value at this pixel should be one minus alpha times A plus alpha times B. Why does that make sense? Well, suppose that alpha is equal to zero, right? That means that I have exactly just A and none of B. If alpha, if alpha is equal to one, I get half of A and half of B. If alpha is equal to, say, one third, like in this picture, it's like saying take two thirds from A because I'm closer and one third of B because I'm farther away. And the same way, if the point that I wanted to figure out lies on one of these exact vertical lines, I could call this B or beta and this one minus beta, the value here should be something like, you know, uh, one minus beta times the pixel value at A plus beta times the pixel value at C. And if I'm fully in the middle, then I should be basically combining the pixel values from all four of these guys in proportion to how close I am to each of them, right? So this, this guy here, if I call this pixel X, this pixel X should have basically a combination where I'm saying I want, um, you know, one minus beta. Actually, I could think about this as um, the following. So I could say I want one minus beta A plus beta C. That's the value here. I multiply that by one minus alpha, and then I have one minus beta times B plus beta times D, I multiply that by alpha, right? So here, what I'm doing is I'm combining all four image locations. So my X is saying take one minus alpha, one minus beta times A plus one minus beta times alpha B plus one minus alpha times beta times C plus alpha beta times D, okay? And again, that should stand to reason, right? So if alpha and beta are both small, that means that I'm over here in this corner, right? That means I should be taking most of my image color from A and this term will be really big, right? Whereas conversely, if alpha and beta, you know, if these are both really, uh, small, then there's not going to be very much weight on D at all, right? And the way that I've lined this up, these weights all add up to one, right? So if I'm right in the middle, then the weight from each of these corner pixels is going to be a quarter, okay? And so this is called bilinear interpolation. And you can see why this is better in MATLAB. So if I instead were to say, okay, give me that rotation, I'm going to make a new image. And instead, I want to have it be bilinear interpolation. Oops, I did mean that. So let's again zoom in on the eye of the shark. So this is the old version with nearest neighbor interpolation. And this is the new version. Right, so there's a huge difference in the quality of interpolation that line, for example, between the blue and the white looks much smoother than it does over here. And this is kind of a noisier looking image because you know, I'm not doing any sort of like smoothing between noisy pixels of the original image. Whereas here, I'm getting a lot of a, you know, I'm getting nicer curves, right? If I kind of zoom in on the, on the curve of this 
thing, you can see here it looks kind of jaggedy, and here it looks smoother, right? So I'm not really sure why MATLAB doesn't do bilinear interpolation by default, uh, other than the fact that it maybe takes longer to do, but I mean, it didn't take that long to do, so I'm not sure why. You can also see that there is a, um, if I go back to the um, documentation, another method it gives you is bicubic interpolation, which means that instead of using just the four nearest neighbors where that pixel falls, uh, instead you could do something a little bit more advanced where you could say uh, my, if these are my original grid of image pixels and the, and the guy falls here, maybe instead of just using these four neighbors to estimate the pixel intensity, I actually bring in all these guys. I use like all 16 neighbors and you can imagine that you could fit like a nice cubic spline surface to this local grid of four points and then say, okay, what is the corresponding value here? So by cubic interpolation, you know, uses more points and also is likely to look smoother. In practice, I don't think you necessarily have to go all the way to, to bicubic, but it is an option. Okay. And like I said, finally, there are lots of geometric transformations that don't fit into, like I said, affine or projective. And so um, other geometric transformations exist. Right? So for example, we saw in the image mosaic example that I could have something that would kind of bow the images of the image or the edges of the image out a little bit, right? For example, this is like lens distortion or lens undistortion. Or I could do something even more complicated where I say, okay, I'm going to take this image, I'm going to grid it up, and then I'm going to move each of these control points separately. Like I said, like I could, I could warp every rectangle of the image on its own to make this kind of weird local deformation of the image, right? That would also be a geometric transformation, but I could represent with a bunch of crazy, you know, if I'm in this block of pixels, do this kind of if-then statement thing, right? And I could do then, for example, bilinear interpolation inside each of these, you know, deformed quadrangles. So lots of these nonlinear transformations are possible, right? And if you have a function, if you have a program like Photoshop, for example, um, so it would be a good example. I'm not sure actually if I have Photoshop on this machine. I may have some cheesy version of Photoshop. I wonder if there's Microsoft Paint on this. Uh, hey, good old Microsoft Paint. So I'm not sure whether this actually does anything fancy though. Uh, rotate. Now, see this, so this is all, all the stuff we just talked about. I thought I installed the uh, No. No, I guess I don't have Photoshop on this machine. Uh, install app. I'm not going to install the app. But anyway, you guys have certainly seen uh, examples of, you know, if you kind of do that pull down menu in a Photoshop where you say, okay, you know, there's all sorts of weird local distortion stuff that you can do. And all that means is that instead of having a nice function that's an affine transformation, you have some sort of a complicated function like, you know, the output is some function of the input pixel and some other function for the y coordinate, right? So that's just general geometric transformation. You can do all sorts of stuff with the image. Okay, so um, questions or comments? Okay, so obviously most of the time you're not going to have to uh, so, so in the homework, let me just kind of say what's coming down the pike. So uh, in the homework, for example, I have to remember what I asked you to do. Um, there's an example where I want you to actually work out a bilinear interpolation where I say, okay, you know, here is where the pixel is. You know what these colors are. Figure out what this value should be, right, using this formula. Um, there's another one that's along the lines of figure out what the affine transformation should be. So in some sense, that's like saying, how do you fit a transformation to a set of data points? And so in that case, that's like saying, I tell you 
a bunch of examples of this point went to here, this point went to here, and so on. If I know enough of the such points, I should be able to figure out uh, how to fit the six parameters of an affine transformation like this, right? Because in some sense, every equation gives me, uh, or every, every point corresponds, gives me two equations in the six unknowns that I have to figure out. And so really all I need are three point correspondences to establish an affine transformation. And so that's a problem that you can solve in MATLAB, for example, by setting up the linear system that corresponds to, you know, I've got some big six by six matrix, for example, these are my unknowns, and I can use MATLAB to solve for these things. And you should be able to find that you can exactly fit when you have three one-to-one -one correspondences, you can fit an affine transformation exactly. And if you don't have, if you have more than three, then you would fit it in an approximate way. And that's what I was doing with my control point selecting example before. Okay, that's it. So I will see you guys on Thursday because of the holiday.